Welcome to Daryl Landa Sentinel's Editorial Board Interview for House District 40, um, State House District 40. Today we are joined by the, both candidates for this race. Um, we have um, Democrat LaVon Bracey Davis, who is the Senior Director of Community Programming at the Dr. Phillips Center for the Performing Arts and an attorney. Her Republican opponent is um, Nate Robertson, who is a strategic account manager for a medical distribution company and an ordained minister. Um, we are going to be spending about a half an hour talking about some of the major issues in this race. Um, we've asked both candidates to keep their answers to around 90 seconds and so that we can keep this moving. And we have um, about 30 minutes for the, for the interview, and we will ask um, each candidate to kind of give us a closing pitch as to why they would be the best candidate for District 40. And um, I always start with this question because I think it's really pertains to the only duty that legislators have, which is to write a budget. And it's not going to be easy. Um, because starting next year, this voluminous flow of money that has been coming from the federal government is going to start to dry up. Now, Florida has saved some of it, but what should it be doing to get ready and, and plan um, in the coming year for that, that loss of federal funding? And um, let's start with uh, Mr. Robertson. Sure. Thanks so much, Chris and Scott, for having me. It's really a, a great pleasure to be with you today. You know, this this question is really important, right? As you noted, you know, the first thing that we must do is we must assess the critical funding needs of Florida when it comes to safety and infrastructure. Then we must be willing to review all of the expenses, and we've got to look at what cuts can be made throughout the budget. Uh, we need to make sure that there is waste removed from the budget to make sure that we remain in a surplus, right? It's really important that we continue to remain in that surplus. We must, you know, reduce state spending in areas that has inhibited the ability of Floridians to prosper. We must give Floridians the ability to have more opportunities for economic prosperity and reduce government spending that makes it harder on individuals. Reducing the size of the government has to be a priority in the next session of the legislature, in my opinion. Thank you so much, Ms. Davis. Uh, good morning, and thank you so much for this opportunity. It, I am humbled and I'm excited about the opportunity to be able to speak with you and ultimately um, some of the voters of House District 40. As it relates to uh, the budget, I think we need to um, prioritize small businesses and prioritize uh, people and community centered spending. And this is an opportunity for us to put money into sustainable industries while cutting away some fat. Um, I understand that because of COVID, there was a surplus and some, and some great monies that came uh, from the federal government, but those monies will, um, if they have not already, dry up. And I think we need to put some money in our workforce, put some money in businesses and especially small businesses so that we can sustain some of these industries so that we can operate outside of COVID funding. Uh, we understand that we are in an affordability crisis right now. Um, Floridians can't afford to be Floridians. So I would suggest that we put some money in people, put some money in the community and put some money in the small business workforce so that we can sustain past COVID. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wanted to move on to a different topic, and this has to do with abortion. It's a question we were asking uh, all candidates with the recent Supreme Court decision. Obviously, this uh, issue is going back to the states, and a lot of voters have told us on both sides of the aisle that they want to know specifically where their candidate stands. So I was going to ask you with some specificity, can you tell us what restrictions you believe there should be in terms of choices and with specific weak counts with regards to abortion and what exemptions uh, you think there should be, if any? And uh, we'll start with you, Ms. Davis. Um, I am 
pro-choice and I believe that uh, what happens with a woman's body should be between the woman, her doctor and her family and uh, the legislature should have no parts in that. So I'm very disappointed by the 15 week ban. Um, I think there, uh, the exceptions were, uh, there shouldn't be um, any exceptions. And I think rape, um, the rape and incest, it, it's, it's, uh, it's disappointing that a, a woman would still have to have a uh, baby despite rape and incest. I think the 15 week ban is, is, is despicable. And I don't think that, um, I don't think that there's a such thing as one size fits all as it relates to abortion. I think that the determination should be between her doctor and her family. So um, definitely 15 weeks is, is despicable, um, but I don't think there's an actual week. I think it should be a discussion with the family and not the legislature. Okay, thank you very much. And Mr. Robertson? Sir, thanks so much for the question. First, I think that we just should acknowledge that regardless of my um, election or Ms. Bracey Davis' election, the legislature has the votes to further restrict abortion. But I do wanna answer your question. First, I believe that we should support women and families in crisis and unexpected pregnancies better than just telling them that they should have an abortion. Abortion is the only medical procedure that intentionally ends the life of at least one of the people involved. My faith really informs my values. And based on that, I do not agree with abortion. We should always protect um, women during pregnancy. We should always be addressing critical needs if her life is in jeopardy. And we should always you know, plan to deliver the child early if that is needed to make sure that the health of the mother is protected. But the question that we really should be talking about is how are we um, going to determine when human rights protection is due to the baby, to the unborn child. You know, in District 40, I want to focus on more on, on human rights for all of the district. When women go in for their full, first ultrasound when they're pregnant, usually the word baby is used and often it's even put on the image. So we must talk about the reality that the baby is deserving of the right to live. We need to do what we need to do is continue to serve women and make sure they have all opportunities and all help that they need when it comes to pregnancy and crisis and unintended pregnancies. We can't legislate hearts. We must make abortion more and more unthinkable in the hearts and minds of women throughout Florida. Okay. I am in favor of further restrictions. Okay, and I was gonna say, and I, I told you at the beginning, I was gonna push for yeah. specifics, uh, mm -hmm. weak counts. Are you saying uh, you don't believe there should be, women should ever have a right, or is there, a, what week do they deserve a choice after? Or until. Sure. Yeah, again, I, I personally do not believe in abortion at any stage. Um, I do think that probably the most logical next step for the legislature is either to move to a heartbeat ban like 15 other states have done since the Dobbs decision or okay. move to a full ban. Okay, thank you. I would like to, keeping with our um, desire to keep moving, um, one of the biggest um, issues in Central Florida is the fact that as a tourism economy, we have the lovely position of being a donor to the rest of the state. Um, Orange County doesn't get back anywhere near the amount of money that sends to Tallahassee. And districts like District 40, which is basically south of Apopka and mostly um, west of of 41, do suffer sometimes for that. What do you think that the um, Orange County's legislative delegation can be doing to recapture some of that funding and, and make sure that Orange County gets its fair share um, of tax money based on the amount that sends to Tallahassee? And if we'd start with Mr. Robertson. Yeah, you know, absolutely. This is a really important issue. And I really believe that what we need to do is we need to make sure that local communities like, you know, here in Orange County and the various communities that Orange County serves are able to make more decisions regarding how their part of the money is spent. We need to be focusing on making sure that we are giving the residents of District 40, the businesses of District 40, the infrastructure of District 40, more, more funding available for housing initiatives, more small business development, you know, more charter and private schools conveniently located within District 40 and specifically throughout Pine Hills. 
you know, more funding to make sure that our communities are stronger. I do think it's critical that we make sure that we make the funding more available to communities to make sure and address critical needs that maybe have been um, either unintentionally or intentionally overlooked in the past. Thank you, Ms. Davis. And this is why, thank you for this question. This is why um, I believe you need a skilled uh, legislator in Tallahassee that can go uh, across the aisle and uh, really can advocate on behalf of Orange County and specifically District 40. I believe uh, tourism do dollars need to come back to the tourism industry. The tourism industry is very broad. That is inclusive of, of roads. That is inclusive of arts and culture. I believe that money needs to come to the tourism industry because it has a Tax, that taxes the tourism industry and it needs to come right back to tourism. And you need a fierce, um, uh, uh, excited, aggressive legislator in Tallahassee that will uh, do whatever they can to bring some of that money back to um, Orange County and House District 40. And that legislator is me. I'm excited to lead. I am excited to uh, go to Tallahassee and remind Tallahassee of Orange County and the funding that we need to be prosperous. As Orange County, of course, is the hub of tourism and uh, that money needs to come back to the industry. And that, again, that industry is very broad, inclusive of roads and bridges, inclusive of arts and culture, and so many things, not just beds and heads. And uh, um, I am ready to add my skill set to Tallahassee and bring that funding home. Okay, and, and actually, um, you answered the question that I, be, I bet Scott was about to ask, which is um, the, um, the resort tax that, that Florida pays. I was actually asking about um, overall sales tax revenue. Oh, sorry. And, and how much um, Orange County sends overall to the, to the general fund. Um, is that, I mean, do, do you have some plans to recapture some of that money? Because that is, that is a large, that is a very large sum of money. And then we'll flip the, flip the script when you're done and, and ask Mr. Robertson about the uh, resort tax money. Oh, sure thing. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that, Chris. Um, again, we're in an affordability crisis and I, I, don't think we should minimize this. We're in an affordability housing crisis. Um, we are dealing with inflation. I think if I had to say what my number one priority would be to do with, with tax dollars is to figure out um, housing and to figure out how we could uh, um, how we can assist Floridians in finding affordable housing. If if rent and housing have gone up by 30% and the paychecks have not, I think there needs to be some incentives, incentives to the landlords, incentives to the builders, incentives to the construction companies, so that we can have some houses, more houses, and people can live and afford to live and afford to rent and afford to buy. I also think we need to expand some of the programs that are always already in place, the Hometown Heroes programs that gets $25,000 uh, down payment assistance. Also, the um, housing assistance fund that can help pay your rent and utility bills. I think the issue right now is money. People need cash and people need money to live. And I think some of those tax dollars need to go to the people. Okay, Mr. Robertson, I apologize for my little pet book glitch there. Um, would you like to um, tackle the question about whether what kind of flexibility Orange County should have in spending its resort tax money? Yeah, definitely. I think that so many people are focused on the same issues right now, right? It's about money. It's about being able to spend money to make our communities stronger. And I'm really concerned about making sure that the communities of District 40 are stronger. And so because of that, I do definitely believe that we need to be spend, being able to spend the tourism tax in a way that makes sense for building the community, right? Sometimes it seems like we see additional large buildings, large convention centers, things like that continuing to be built when it seems like when you drive through, especially parts of Pine Hills, that it seems like there's been great neglect um, in making sure that we're community building. So I definitely think that we need to really investigate and see how can we use those dollars to better support the communities of District 40. 
Thank you very much. I want to change topics here and talk a little bit about uh, what the governor uh, describes as woke ideology. It's something he's uh, crusaded against pretty consistently over the past two years. There are a lot of facets to his attempts to attack that, but I want to focus on one specific from uh, his stop woke bill, the part of the ban that says government should tell private companies what kind of diversity and sensitivity training programs they can offer. I was wondering if that's something you support, specifically government telling private sector what kind of uh, human resources and training programs it can offer. And we'll start with you, Mr. Robertson. Yeah, I think it's a great question. It's a critical question, right? I think that we need to make sure that we are empowering business to make the best decisions for them as they continue to grow, right? As they continue to be a part of our communities and servicing our communities. I think that we should be careful about how much we are training, um, doing training in one area of, you know, a, a human resources, you know, conversation as another and make sure that we are really using a broad basing, um, you know, approach to true equality for everyone. Everybody should feel equal and valued in our society and definitely businesses should have the ability to make sure that they are doing the training that they feel like is necessary for their workforce. I do think that we have to, you know, also just continue to make sure that we are um, being cautious in how much we are ever forcing individual private businesses to make decisions that affect them and their employees and even their consumers. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. I'm, uh... all right, Ms. Davis. While I think certain industries and businesses know their industry and business perhaps better than lawmakers and legislators, I think um, diversity, equity, and inclusion training is extremely important, especially in this day and age where it, it becomes minimized and forgotten and marginalized. I think it's extremely important. And um, I think that that's what helps companies um, good companies become great companies is when they understand our differences. And it is disturbing to me that we have weaponized DEI training and we have weaponized uh, some things as it relates to HR and open up doors for, for suing and to make companies feel that it's not as important. Because at the end of the day, understanding differences and understanding people and understanding diversity is extremely important and it could help businesses thrive. So it's been weaponized, I believe, by the government and a Republican legislator. And um, it's very disappointing because at the end of the day, um, all these things with these cultural wars is, is uh, it seems to be mean spirited and it seems to have an underlying reason that has nothing to do with what the issue is on its face. Um, especially when you go to the, the topic of uh, teaching history and, and um, uh, uh, telling stories in school and telling the stories of history. I just think it, it is, it is um, there's an underlying reason. It has lots to do with uh, the governor and his agenda and his agenda beyond uh, Florida. Thank you very much. I have a, um, a question that is something that was a debate and then kind of stopped being a debate for a while, but it's still an opportunity. Um, should Florida expand Medicaid to include working adults? Um, it's an opportunity that was made available under the Affordable Care Act. Florida never took advantage of it. And, um, and I would like to know if you think that, that it's time to consider doing that. Mr. Robertson, do you want to start with that one? Sure. Thank, thanks, Chris. You know, I think that this is, again, a really important issue, right? One for us to con consider how we should handle making sure that our working adults have the access they need, right, to good health care and making sure that they have that assistance. I do think that we need to continue to look at how do we support those who are trying to make that step up, right? They're trying to get out of maybe a difficult situation that they've been in and trying to advance themselves. And how is the government assisting them as they make that transition up? Um, I do think that um, there might be um, an opportunity for some slight expansion of Medicaid to working adults to make sure that they have that assistance as they are transitioning in their economic you know, development. Since you have a little bit left in your time, how how big is slight? 
Yeah, I think, you know, I think that that be, is challenging at times of how should we do that? Because I think that we have to be careful of, um, of expanding Medicaid for working adults to the point that it just becomes perpetual. So I'm not sure exactly what I would say that amount of time or that assistance should be, but I do think that it needs to be investigated and there needs to be some additional work done to see how do we support that. On top of that, I think we need to make sure that we're helping working adults to have more access to healthcare resources, more access to healthcare insurance that they can afford as well. Thank you. And um, Ms. Davis, same question. Um, the expansion of Medicaid is the right thing to do. I believe the number now is 800,000 Floridians cannot afford health care insurance. It's the right thing to do. It is very disappointing that uh, Florida has determined not to expand. And it's also very disappointing that Florida left some affordable health care monies on the table. Um, it, it needs to be expanded, period. Uh, I think uh, part of your right as a citizen is that you have good health care. And it's, it's extremely important, especially for our seniors and our veterans. Um, I think even though uh, Florida has determined not to expand uh, Medicaid, I think uh, some innovative solutions can um, can be arrived, uh, perhaps subsidizing pharmacy medicine, which was uh, dis a discussion in the legislature recently, expanding telehealth. Um, so there are some other things that we could do, but I, it, it's it's really disappointing again that you have 800,000 Floridians that can't afford healthcare insurance, and um, there was some opting to not expand. So yes, medication Medicaid expansion is is one of the things that I will support wholeheartedly when I go to Tallahassee. Well, and the other insurance question on everybody's mind right about now, thank you, Ian, is the question of. Um, Property insurance. Florida is in a legitimate property insurance crisis. We have a big old storm headed our way. And um, there are people who are bare right now because they can't afford it. Um, what changes should Florida be looking at to its property insurance um, laws that will make insurance more affordable and accessible for property owners across the state? Um, um, Ms. Davis, can we start with you? Yes. Well, again, it, it, while property insurance is a, a, a big deal, um, it's, we're at an affordability crisis. So it's not just a property insurance, it's that Floridians can't afford to be Floridians right now. And it's, it's, it's so very unfortunate. Again, I go back to, I believe in incentives. Um, the, we need to uh, incentivize insurance companies to stay here. We need to incentivize the homeowners. Um, money in pockets right now is really what would help um, with all of these issues. And I think we need to expand some of the programs that are already in place that will help with property insurance. We need to fund them, fund them, and fund them fully so that um, homeowners can reach out to some of these programs and get money in their pockets now to pay for uh, the inflation and the prices that are going up with property insurance. Thank you so much. Mr. Robertson, same question. Yeah, thanks again, Chris. And you know, on this issue, I think it sounds like there's a lot of things that LaVon and I agree on. We have got to make sure that we are addressing the needs of all of the residents of Florida and especially District 40 and making sure that they have more resources, right? More access to money of their own. And it's not being always being used to be spent on other things. The, the homeowner's um, property insurance is a crisis. And one of the things that I think needs to continue to happen is we need to continue to be, el be eliminating and capping the fees, especially when it comes to attorneys and litigation regarding homeowner's insurance, because that is factored in to the premiums that people are paying. Homeowners need to have confidence that they can insure their property with a reputable company without their rates being priced so high that they can't afford it. So there has to be more work done. There needs to be incentives put in place to make sure that companies are insuring Florida, Florida homes and that they are staying in Florida. We need to make sure that we continue to address this issue because it is one of those ways that we make sure that there is more for each resident in District 40. We are getting pretty close to the end of our time, but I wanted to sneak in one more question. Um, um, going from crisis to crisis to crisis, um, 
Florida schools, most districts are reporting extreme difficulty in hiring and retaining teachers, and they fear that it's only going to get worse. What can the legislature do that it hasn't already done to support teachers, particularly veteran teachers, who may have felt left out of recent um, legislative moves on, on school funding? And um, Mr. Robertson, may I start with you? Sure, thanks, Chris, for the question. You know, this question is really important. And I, I spoke with my sister-in-law um, this weekend in, in talking about this question and this idea. She's been a Florida educator for, I think, now almost 20 years. And she talked with some of her colleagues as well. You know, I think first, first, and this isn't necessarily something the legislator can do on its own. I think first, we've got to make sure that we are showing the value to our veteran teachers. We've got to show the value to our educators who have put the blood, sweat, and tears into their education career. And that's not just in salary improvements, though it needs to be a big part of it, but it's also in making sure that they have access to more training, to more ways to show the appreciation to them, making sure that they feel like they have the support of those around them. I think that the legislature needs to continue to look at how are we supporting the, the salaries of teachers throughout the state, the state legislature in the recent years has been able to put well over $500 million into increasing teacher sal salaries, and the legislature plans to do more, and we must continue to do more. We also need to make sure that we are being strategic in how we're recruiting teachers. The first, those to come to Florida institutions to get their education degrees, and those to stay. I would be in favor of making sure that we are continuing to offer incentives for teachers to stay in Florida, and, and potentially be helping to reduce their student loan debt as they are committing to you know, a performance standard and a years of service in the, in the classroom. Thank you. No doubt about it, the state government should fully fund public education, fully fund public education. I am a huge advocate that teachers need to be paid appropriately and properly. Um, teachers having second and third jobs and not being able to focus on teachers is, is disappointing. Um, before we can talk about uh, private schools or alternatives schools, I believe that we need to fully fund public education. I don't believe in this reverse Robin Hood. I don't believe in taking money from public school systems and putting in the private sector first. I believe that we fully fund public education. And if there is any leftover, then we can give to the private. But um, recruitment is, is vitally important. Bonuses, and not just bonuses to come, but bonuses to stay, and definitely bonuses for longevity and veterans. Um, so it does start with the money. Um, we know that whenever we're asked or interviewing for the job, that's the first question we ask is what is the compensation? How will I be compensated? So while there are other things that I think are attractive to keep teachers, it starts with the money. We need to fully fund public education, no if, ands, or buts about it. And then we can talk about private schools after public education is fully funded. Well, thank you so much. Um, and we have come to the uh, end of our time that we've allotted for this interview. Um, I wanted to invite both of our candidates to make a closing statement. But before I do that, I would like to let our readers know we will be making a recommendation in this race, but there is a lot of information out there, including both candidates have websites or Facebook pages that you can look at and get more information about their platforms. Of course, we're going to have our excellent Sentinel coverage as always. So take a look at both of these people and you've had a chance to meet them today. And, and decide who best matches your values, and please be sure to vote. Now, um, I kind of did a little coin toss, and I have uh, Mr. Robertson going first. Um, if you would um, give us your 90-second pitch as to why you're the right choice in this race. Thanks so much, Chris and Scott. Thank you to the Orlando Sentinel for having me today. You know, I believe that I am the best choice for this um, seat because District 40 needs more representation with action. I will be a represent. I will be a representative who will work to make sure that District 40 has more, more education choice. Parents deserve that right. More economic prosperity. Everyone deserves more money in their pocket. 
more personal freedom so that the government's not looking over our shoulder telling us what medical decisions to make. When I talk to people throughout District 40, and especially in Pine Hills, which is about half of this district, they say that they feel forgotten, that they feel invisible, that they feel like people talk about them and tell them things will get better, but things never do. It only gets worse. One voter in Pine Hills actually laughed when I asked her the question of if she felt like things have been getting better or worse over the last five to 10 years, because she was so aghast with just the reality that it feels like it's been getting worse. Because I will be on the majority side in Tallahassee, I can work to get the attention that this district needs in a way that my opponent will not be able to. I can get funding allocated to District 40 to address education, small business development, and safety. Thank you so much. Hey, Ms. Davis. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity. I'm so grateful. Um, I am an avid reader of the Orlando Sentinel and a supporter of the work that you all do. So appreciate this opportunity to speak with you. Um, I am a resident of Okoe, an arts advocate, and most importantly, a community and public servant. I am a daughter of this district, a graduate of Dr. Phillips High School, Howard University, and the inaugural class of FAMU College of Law. I am a former Department of Children and Families attorney, and I champion for the safety, security, and permanency of Florida's abused, abandoned, and neglected children. As mentioned in the opening, I am a senior director of community programming at the Dr. Phillips Center, where I partnered with over 600 local businesses and small organizations that feed millions of dollars into our Central Florida economy. I'm a board member for Pace Center for Girls, where I try my best to help girls who have experienced trauma find their greatness. I am a nine-year Florida State legislative appointee for the Florida Council on Arts and Culture, where I've advised the Secretary of State and annually rank and allocate over $40 million of grant funding. So I've already been working across the aisles and bringing funding home to this district. I'm a four-year volunteer mentor for a Valencia Take Stock in Children Horizons program. My skill set makes me unequivocally qualified for this job. I will fight for your ideals. I'm talking directly to the voters now. I am sincere about this work, and as each of you are sincere about the work that you do in your homes, churches, communities, and civic organizations. Our goals are the same. I am from a family of public servants. I am excited for this opportunity to go to Tallahassee and be a champion for issues relating to the affordable housing shortage, women's rights, civil rights, employment, affordable health care, education, economic development, and equity. A vote for me is a vote for progress. Again, my name is LaVon Bracey Davis. Thank you both for joining us. We really do appreciate it. And uh, we wish you the best of luck. And um, Look, look forward to seeing how the race turns out.